Do you ever wonder if it's going to be difficult to follow Christ? And maybe some of the things that Christ demands from us are very difficult or very hard, or are there things that uh, we would have a really hard time giving up? Um, some things are clear, what we must let go of, and other things are not so clear. They don't necessarily seem like a bad thing. They don't seem like something's wrong. I want us to get into the Word tonight, as we always do. I want us to jump into the book of Luke, chapter 9, starting in verse 51. This is where we'll be uh, until the end of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to go there, great. If you just want to listen, that's fine too. I'm just glad you're here. So let's just jump in to verse 51, and we'll read, and then we'll talk about some of this stuff. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked the Lord, Do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went on to another village. I'm just going to briefly stop right there just to show you, you know, let's just not overlook uh, James and John's character. There is a reason that they were called the sons of thunder. Uh, they were uh, fiery. They were uh, zealous for Jesus, uh, maybe sometimes misplaced. Um, and clearly it was one of these times because Jesus turns and rebukes them. And, and I'm sure he was like, come on, I'm not going to, I didn't come here to Sodom and Gomorrah, this Sam Samaritan town. So, um, but let's continue reading. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. So let's stop. So there's this man <clears throat> who's coming alongside while they're walking on the road, which was very common back in the day. Nowadays we have cars and metal and glass that separate us from everybody. So we don't really have these on the road conversations that they would so often have back then. So this man comes along and says, hey, I'll follow you, makes this bold statement, I'll follow you wherever you go. And I love Jesus' response. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And essentially what Jesus is saying is, I want to make sure you understand before you follow me what you'll be following. And that is a man that doesn't have the common comforts of the day. He doesn't have a house. He doesn't have a, <clears throat> a donkey. He doesn't have a, a, a nice place to go at the end of a long ministry and, and lay in a nice bed in a palace or any of those things. He sets up a tent or he lays in the open country field with his followers. This is what He's explaining to the man in this kind of, um, oh, it's not so so um, kind of hard to understand. He just uses the the foxes and the birds to help this guy understand. I don't have a, I don't have a home base. I don't have modern comforts of today. And I think that's one of the things that I want to start off tonight by talking about is oftentimes Jesus asks us out of our comfort zone. Or he demands that we not have a regular societal basic comfort that maybe we feel that we should have. And he will call us away. If we want to follow him, we may have to give up uh, our comfort. And we may have to give up our comfort zone. We may have to give up our comfort space. We may have to give up our comfort leisure or our comfort vacation or our comfort whatever it is that you find comfort in. Back then, surely it was a house because they were also very poor and it was hand to mouth. So again, Jesus will often ask you to say goodbye to some comforts, to follow him. Uh, here in America, we don't see that a lot because we're so rich and we're so wealthy and we're so well off and we all have a home or an apartment or a condo or something where we live. We don't see abject poverty. But in other places, we do. Now, I'm not saying we don't have poor people here on the streets, but to see an entire city of uh, like a, a Hooverville or, or a poverty-stricken tent city, uh, we don't see that. And so I want us to understand that oftentimes you can't stay in a comfortable place and go follow Jesus. You have to go talk to that person that is uncomfortable, right? You have to go in that part of town that's 
not really comfortable to be in. You may have to go and be in this meeting to talk to these people about your faith and the reason that you did what you did and took the stand that you took. And that's not a comfortable place to be because it is going against the grain. And when you go against the grain, oftentimes you get splinters and it's rough and it's coarse. And if you go against the flow and it's harder, it's more difficult, you stumble and fall and you're striving for something better. Remember this, uh, dear children, you, uh, to go to hell, you don't have to do something outrageous. You don't have to do something horrendous. You don't have to kill or, or have an adulterous relationship. All you have to do is coast on. You just have to coast on and live your life the way that you think best. That's ultimately all you have to do to go to hell. You just have to keep doing what you think is best. And in your minds, you may be a good person. But the Lord Jesus says very clearly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through him, which is an indication that he is the way, the key, the door, and you have to do what he says and be where he is and act like he acts. If you want the Father to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, come and join your master's happiness. Let's break that down for just a moment. Well done, right? That scripture in Matthew 25 there, well done, indicating you're doing something good and faithful. You were doing it well and consistently. Good and faithful servant taking a humble position. See, we, all, we hear this nonsense all the time. It's not, it's not works-based. It's not a works-based thing. If we're talking about how to get salvation, sure, you must be baptized, you must confess that Jesus is Lord, and you must pledge your allegiance to him. But then after those confessions and the baptism, what then? Well, you have to work your faith out. Work your own faith out in fear and trembling. There's a work element. See, we don't work for salvation. Salvation causes us to work our salvation out. There is a work element to it. Lazy Christians say there's no work at all. We just say a thing, pray a thing, and we're good to go for life. We can live how we want. We can look like a pagan, act like a pagan, smell like a pagan, taste like a pagan, but we're going to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. So let's understand what it means to follow Christ. So the first thing he will call you out of your comfort zone. Let's go on. He said to another, now I want you to notice the difference here. The first guy asked to follow. The second guy is being called to follow. So he's, uh, he said to another, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, is there anything wrong with what that man wanted to do? No. We're, we're told to be good to our family. We're told to um, do what is right. That's not a bad thing to do, go bury your father. But Jesus makes a very, very interesting comment about what this guy says. He says, first, let me go. First of all, there ha he wanted there to be something first, right? I'm coming, Lord, but first, no, we don't, the Lord doesn't do that. He doesn't, he's not second to anybody, regardless of your family, regardless of your children. When the Lord calls you, he calls you right then, right there to go and do this thing and not make excuses. Then he says even something even more such. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. Well, what does that mean? Well, let the dead spiritually bury their physical dead. But you, the one that's spirit-filled, we don't know anything about this man or, or woman. We don't know anything about, uh, he said to another man, so he is a man. 
We don't know anything about it, but the Lord does say to proclaim the kingdom of God. So this man apparently had been around a while or at least knew enough to then go and proclaim. Jesus doesn't take a back seat to anybody, not even your family. And oftentimes, depending on how you grew up, some of you, you out there did not benefit from being brought up in a Christian household. So if you found Christ later and then you tried to come uh, together with your family again, it, it's not going to work. You're not going to see eye to eye. And the Lord says very clearly, I come to divide. I bring a sword to divide mother and father, to divide child from mother and child from father and three one way and two the other. So the Lord will sometimes call you away from your very own family because you are a part of a new family now. You are a part of a heavenly family. The Lord God is your father and the church are your brothers and sisters. And we are the bride of Christ. And so it is a changing of the mind. It is a changing of your family identity that the Lord will ask of you. He may ask this of you. Now, if you grew up in a Christian home like I did, uh, this may not be something that you had to do. But if you didn't, you grew up Muslim or you grew up Buddhist or Hindu or another religion and then you turned to Christ, oftentimes those families would have a mock burial for you. They would cast you out and throw your belongings. Some of them may try to kill you. So the Lord will and sometimes does Call you away from your blood relatives. So first we have, you must say goodbye to comfort. And sometimes you must say goodbye to family. Let's go on to the last one here. Uh, still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Another very extreme statement from the Lord here. Uh, this man says, I'll follow you, but, right? There's that, again, like the last guy um, who was called, this one here proclaimed he would, but he wanted to do something first. And Jesus says to him, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The Lord, may, the Lord demands dedication. This is something he demands. He demands our full and utter dedicated loyalty. And sometimes that means leaving and going without all of the pleasantries. We love our pleasantries. We love to say goodbye and have long goodbyes. And sometimes if you look at some of the missionaries, they didn't get to have that. It was a right now thing. It was a right then and there thing that they had to do. And the Lord says, no one that starts the ministry and then longs for the things they used to have and looks back or goes back is fit for service in the kingdom of heaven. Notice what he says, puts a hand to the plow. Now, when you're plowing and you're moving forward, back then they would use an animal and a plow and that would be pulled behind and they would guide it. He's essentially saying, you are looking, your focus is ahead. Your focus is forward. Your focus is where the oxen are going, where the plow is digging. You are not looking behind you. You're not seeing what's happening back there. You don't care what's happening back there because your focus is forward. Your focus is what's ahead, the new, the unbroken ground, the, the ready to be planted. That's what he wants. You see, somebody that's plowing a field, that's not paying attention to where they're going or how it's plowing, isn't going to do a very good job because they're always looking back. They're always doing this. Do you ever teach a kid how to ride a bike and they want to look down at their feet and they, and they always wobble and they, and they don't get it straight and they're going all over? What are they supposed to do? Don't look where you are. Look where you want to go. So they look ahead. You are looking ahead to Christ, not behind to your old life. You must look ahead to Christ. Keep your eyes fixed on him and then you will plow straight. You will walk straight. You will plant fully. You will water correctly. We must not look back to what we were. So Christ will call you out of your comfort. He'll call you away from family and he will demand full loyalty and dedication. I want you to understand something. 
It is our job to be in the service of Christ. We must be workers of the gospel and servants of the Most High. There is a working element, there is a dedication element, there is a consistent element, and there is a loyalty element. Do not neglect any of these things. And let us go serve our King. May the Lord bless you wherever you are. And I love you.